All right, uh, we're going to get started. Good morning and welcome, everyone. This is the uh, meeting of the Committee on the Revision of the Penal Code, which is now in session. I'm Michael Romano, Committee Chair. Um, thanks to all of you for joining us today, especially in the current circumstances. This is our fourth committee uh, meeting of the year. Uh, I'd like to start off by welcoming our newest uh, member, uh, Professor Priscilla Chen, uh, Ch Ochen, excuse me, who is a professor of law at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Uh, we're excited to have Professor Ochen join us uh, and we look forward to your contribution. So thank you for coming and for joining us. Uh, as for those of us, for those of you who follow us closely, there's one committee seat uh, still to be filled by the governor, which we hope will be filled shortly. Um, with that, I'd like to take the roll call quickly in alphabetical order, Judge Espinoza. Present. Assembly Member Lee. Here. Justice Moreno. Uh, here. Professor Ochin. Here. And Senator Skinner is not here right now, but she'll be joining us shortly, but uh, we still have enough people for a quorum. Um, and with that, I'd just like to uh, briefly run through today's agenda. Today, we'll be hearing from three panels of witnesses covering the topic for today, which is long and extreme sentences, including life without parole, three strikes, and other sentence enhancements in California. We'll also take um, two 10-minute breaks along the way. Tomorrow, the meeting will continue with public comment and deliberation among committee members from what we heard today and from what we heard um, in previous committee meetings, uh, including the death penalty. Today, our topic are statutes that impose the longest sentences in California. This includes life without parole or LWAP sentences, California's three strikes law, and important sensing enhancements such as enhancements for gun use and hate crimes. We have a tremendous collection of panelists today. As the committee always does, we're hearing from people directly impacting, impacted by these laws, including people who have served these sentences, victims of these crimes, representatives from law enforcement, the defense bar, and academics who study the issue. All the way up to the secretary of California's prison system, Kathleen Allison, who will be part of our final panel, prisons, uh, final panel presentation this afternoon. As I expect, we'll hear from all panelists. The United States is uh, an outlier or among its peer nations in its use of life without parole sentences. In California, more than 5,000 people are serving LWAP sentence and 80% of whom are people of color. As with the death penalty, the offenses that lead to LWAP sentences are often among the most serious and troubled that our system handles such as the killing of two police officers that just happened this week. We'll also hear from staunch defenders of these sentences as necessary to maintain public safety in California, and also about research that shows that there are diminished returns to law enforcement by sentencing people uh, to die in prison. We'll also be discussing California's three strikes law, which is perhaps the most well-known sentencing scheme in the country. Today, more than 7,500 people in California are serving a life sentence under the three strikes law. And many more than that, about 25,000 are serving so-called second strike sentences, uh, which are sentences that are doubled uh, by the statute as a result of their prior convictions. Together, these group of people compri comprise uh, more than one third of California's entire prison population. And 80% of this group are people of color. The goal of the committee generally is to study the efficacy and rationality of our penal code. So today's topic is especially important as it explores how California law approaches the longest prison sentence, sentences, the most severe crimes, and people who commit multiple serious and violent felonies. This is just a few thoughts as we start these complex topics. On behalf of the committee, I wanna welcome everyone uh, who is here to, to testify before us and all the people in, uh, in the public. Uh, with our first panel, I'd like to give special thanks uh, for sharing your insights today. Uh, as with all of our panelists, each panelist, uh, as with each of our panels, each panelist will have five minutes to make opening remarks and we'll res reserve the rest of our time for question and answer conversation with committee members. Panelists, please know that if you have given us a written submission, we have read it. So in your opening remarks, please quickly hit the pie points so we can move on to the conversation, which I think is the most valuable part um, of, the, of the meeting today. 
Uh, our first panel will concentrate on life without parole. In this panel, we'll hear from people who are formal, who formerly are serving, were serving life without parole sentences and are now out. A professor who has studied the history of LWAP sentences in California and a deputy district attorney from Los Angeles who prosecutes LWAP cases. The panelists are, and this is the order in which that they will uh, speak. Um, prof uh, professor Christopher Seeds, who's assistant professor of criminology and law and society at UC Irvine. Uh, district, district Attorney Michelle Hennessy, who's president of the Association of Deputy District Attorneys and a member of the California District Attorneys Association Legislative Committee. Um, I want to give special thanks to DA Hennessy for joining us today at the very last minute as a substitute for Placer County DA Morgan Geyer, who had a last minute personal conflict. Uh, our third panelist is Susan Bestamante from California Coalition for Women Prisoners and a former LWAP prisoner herself, and Jared Hopper, uh, Harper, an ambassador for Represent Justice, also a former, uh, formerly sentenced to an LWAP sentence. Um, with that, um, thank you all for joining us. And Professor Seeds, uh, I'd like to start with you for five minutes, please. Thanks very much, Chair Romano. I thank the community for inviting me to comment on life without parole sentencing. And the committee asked me specifically to address the history of life without parole in California, the utility of LWOP and revisions to the penal code concerning life without parole. So as noted, I did provide a written submission to the committee in advance. And what I'd like to do in this brief statement here is to offer a historical picture that I think is important for understanding LWOP as a sentencing practice and for assessing it. So to begin, if we were seated around a table right now, I'd pass around a figure that I think makes the point more clearly than words can about just how singular the use of LWOP in the United States is. And that figure shows all countries that use life without parole sentencing in the world or its, or its equivalent. And there's a distance of roughly 50,000 sentences between the US and the country with the second most LWOP sentences. Put another way, when we consider LWOP in the US relative to similar sentences elsewhere in the world, we have to change the scale. And no nation other than the US authorizes LWOP for juveniles. A second point that's well known to those who read the sentencing project reports is that this massive growth of LWOP in the US has occurred over the past 45 years. We know that nearly 56,000 men and women serve LWOP in the US. Compare that to the 1990s when there was approximately 10,000. 5,000 people serving LWOP are in California, the third most of any US jurisdiction. In five states, including California, account for just over half of the LWAP sentences. We also know that LWAP sentences are imposed disproportionately by race. As this committee staff member points out, and Chair Romano noted in California, 80% of the people serving LWAP are people of color and 70% are black or Latino. So the US is an international outlier. And within the US, LWAP is concentrated in certain states, including California. And as nationally, the growth of LWAP sentences here is a relatively recent phenomenon a product of the last 45 years. Now, I'd like to add to that historical, I mean, to that descriptive picture, a historical piece. Life without parole sentencing is not an entirely new punishment. One finds the penalty authorized in statutes in the early 20th century. And in California, LWOP doesn't begin with the 1978 death penalty law. Historically, California was among the first states to impose life without parole for non-homicide offenses including it for treason in the 1870s and aggravated kidnapping in the 1920s. Life without parole was rarely imposed, however, under those early statutes. And since 1978, the scope of LWAP in California has grown, along with the scope of Section 190.2. And it's also been added as, as punishment for habitual offending, certain sex offenses, and for terrorism. But a point I'd like to emphasize in this introduction is that the rise of life without parole in the last quarter of the 20th century is not simply a matter of growth the meaning of the sentence has changed. For most of the 20th century, life without parole sentences carried with them a reasonable possibility of release. Louisiana, for example, had a long-standing, well-known rule under which people, administrators would recommend for commutation people would serve 10 years and six months of their sentence with good conduct. LWAP sentences in California have undergone a similar transformation. When LWAP was introduced for murder with special circumstance in 78, a provision in the regulations of the Board of Prison Terms provided for review after 12 years and every third year thereafter. This wasn't technically a parole hearing, but there were guidelines for what documents would be relied on and what the interview would discuss. The commissioner who conducted that review would then offer recommendations to the executive. 
That regulation was revised in 1982 to provide for an initial review after 30 years and every fifth year thereafter. And then the regulation was repealed in 1994, officially ending LWOP reviews. There's more than one we wanna know about those reviews and the recommendation process and how it was conducted, but the regulation itself accords with the more general point about the changing meaning of LWOP. In California, as in other states, the LWOP sentence was originally one that conceived of some form of review for release. So to sum up, from an international perspective, from a historical perspective, in terms of the number of life without parole sentences and in terms of the meaning of life without parole, I think it's accurate to say that LWOP as it is known in practice today is an aberration, not a humane sentence, not a sentence that's institutionalized elsewhere in the world, and not a sentence that historically in the United States necessarily meant death in prison. So my recommendations to the committee are prospectively to limit and eliminate LWOP for all offenses and instead follow proposals like those of the sentencing project to require review after a set period of years and routinely thereafter. And for people already serving LWOP, be sure that all youth offender, elder parole and second look reforms include them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Seeds. You were right on five minutes, so I very much appreciate it. Uh, WDA Hennessy. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, life without parole continues to be an effective public safety tool. And it's not necessarily unfair to punish a crime that causes permanent harm with permanent incarceration for certain individuals. A life without parole sentence ensures that victims have finality in the judgment and ensures that they don't have to attend painful parole hearings and repeated parole hearings. In order for an individual to be sentenced to life without parole, the prosecutor must first charge the special circumstance, which means that it has to be adequately supported by evidence for it even to be charged. And then a judge has to find that that special circumstance is supported by probable cause and then a jury has to find it true beyond a reasonable doubt. It's always a fact-driven analysis. And as much as it's important to talk about policy, it's always important to bear in mind the facts that underlie these policy decisions. As noted, 80% of persons serving a life without parole sentence are persons of color. However, communities of color with perhaps the exception of Asian communities are often lower socioeconomic communities. And as a result, they experience higher crime rates and shifts in crime affect them worse than other communities, which causes people of color to be higher represented in the criminal justice system, both as perpetrators and more importantly, as victims. The causation is the socioeconomic factor though. It is not charging decisions made by prosecutors. I also understand that there is some concern about the proportion of women serving life without parole sentences based upon a lying in wait special circumstance. And this is another area where it is important to look at underlying facts. It's honestly not surprising that women due to their disparate physical strength and speed compared to at least 50% of the population in most cases are necessarily going to rely on cunning when they commit a murder against anyone other than a child. Just as men rely on guns to shift the balance of power, women may rely on stealth. But just because the special circumstance is charged against women with greater relative frequency than men, assuming that's an accurate statistic, and you perceive it as unfair for a particular subset, it doesn't mean that particular special circumstance is unfair or invalid. In fact, I did a quick review of appellate cases prior to coming on and in a quick review of cases in which the lying in wait special circumstance was charged, 25 of the first 25 cases that came up, it was charged against men. I didn't find a single female defendant in the entire list. And that's just an example how you, it's not necessarily pure numbers that you have to look at. It is the details of the circumstances that drive the decisions and the circumstances should also to an extent drive the policy. So in summary, just because an individual outcome is perceived as unfair in an individual case, it doesn't invalidate the law as a whole or the policy in the majority of cases where a special circumstance is found true. Thank you. 
Thank you very much also for observing our time. We appreciate it. We're gonna have lots of questions for you both. Uh, Ms. Bustamante. I was incarcerated and uh, for 31 years with the life without sentence. My story started at the age of 12 to 18 by being molested by my own father. I was told I would break our family if I said uh, anything, so I didn't. I was almost 18 when I told my brother. He dealt with my dad. He finally left, left me alone. I met my husband at 19 and married quickly because I was loved. What I didn't know about was the PTSD that he had from Vietnam. There were six years of constant abuse, mental, physical, sexual. I didn't leave because he threatened to kill my mother or my sister. And since he had brought me close to death quite a few times, I believed him. At 24, I was pregnant with child number three. I didn't want to lose my baby. He messed with my head so bad that I had a miscarriage. From that moment, I, I had the abortion. I hated him with every fiber of my being because I felt he killed my baby and it broke me. Once again, I spoke to my brother with the hope I would be able to leave with my daughters. My husband was killed by my brother. I had no idea it would happen. By the time of the trial, my brother had died. So I was the one charged with the murder. I had a um, three days for picking the jury, two days for the trial, three days for deliberation. Nothing was allowed on domestic violence. Nothing was allowed on my molestation. No, I had no defense. The DA convinced the jury it was all my idea. And um, it, it, I was received the extreme sentence of life without. It was amazing how fast my trial went for taking my freedom for the rest of my life for a crime that I did not intend, plan, or commit. My daughters were eight and 11 when I went to prison. It was the hardest thing to do, leaving them. Then the reality of dying in prison was setting in, excuse me, year after year with no hope. The feeling of helplessness and the mental challenges a person with the death sentence has to endure. It was such a scary feeling watching people die after being there for decades and being in my 30s and 40s when they were dying. 80 to 90% of incarcerated women are victims of domestic violence, rape, sex trafficking, et cetera, or first forced to commit their crime. As a founding member of the first battered women's group in the nation, I learned the wheel of abuse and began the healing process. Re the people have been able to get relief from 1437. It needs to be expanded to include people convicted as an accomplice under special circumstances felony murder. That is why I am a part of working on SB 300 and totally supporting it. Much release is needed for LWAPs. I'm hoping a recommendation to remove all types of death sentences, including LWAP from the penal code. They also deserve a chance to come home as I have and not be a burden on the state and to pay taxes. My daughters were 39 and 42 when I was released in, in 9-12 of 18. Thank you. Um. We look forward to speaking with you too. Mr. Harper. Good afternoon, uh, committee members. And it's an honor to be here, um, especially after, after surviving life without the possibility of parole. The sentence that I received as, as a child, as a, as, a, as a former foster youth, at, the, at, a, at a really young age, I was placed into the foster system. And I went throughout the foster care system and it was abusive. Um, I ended up in about 48 different foster homes by the time of my incarceration. Um, by the time I, I, I ended up in the, in the hands of the criminal justice system, I was already broken due to what I had experienced in the foster care system. A lot of what I experienced in the foster care system was physical abuse as well as sexual abuse. The sexual abuse, um, specifically being, being a Black boy in in Inglewood, California. Um, my community um, really, really made it hard on me to, to, to really express myself, um, to really ask for help. Um, there was a lot of peer pressure. There was, there was a lot of mistrust from adults because the, the adults were the people who were, who were harming me. 
I was being molested by the neighborhood bike repairman, um, as well as my younger brother. And, and that went on all the way until I was 13 years old. This is the same individual that I, that I murdered at the age of, of 16. Um, I, I didn't want to take his life. I felt, I felt I had no other choice. I was a child, I was trapped. I was a foster kid and I didn't have parents and I didn't have a way out. After taking his life, I was re-traumatized by our penal system and I was given a sentence of life without the possibility of parole, plus 10 years. Um, I had a hung jury during my first trial and the district attorney refiled all three special circumstances to ensure that I would be given life without the possibility of parole. After going throughout my prison system, I mean, after going throughout my, um, my, my prison uh, term, I, I looked into the discovery packet and I realized that the district attorney had, had, had already sought to give me the, had already sought to give me life without the possibility of parole well before the case had even unraveled. This was, this was during my arrest. And this is again, through discovery. Um, I ended up being um, convicted. Um, I, was, I, was, I was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. And in that, in that process, the judge told me that I was redeemable. He told me that I should not walk among society again, and that my last day should be spent inside of a, of a prison. I went off to prison as, as a 17 year old kid and, and I, I didn't know what had just took place. I ended up going to prison, still, still broken. Um, I, I ended up in, in Lancaster State Prison in a maximum security prison. What I found when I got to prison was that there was so much I didn't know about how to actually survive in this environment. The sentence, along with the folks that I was, I was now in prison with, began to attempt to shape me in a, in a, in a, in a, in a real horrible way. And I chose not to actually go that route. My sentence was, was a hopeless sentence, but I remained hopeful. And I, I knew that I had a ton of work to do. I knew that I had to figure out what was wrong with me and, and what would cause me to, to, to become the kind of person that was capable of such harm in, in, in our community. And, and through self-improvement classes, I, I figured out what was wrong. And what was wrong was that I was traumatized and I wasn't the only one. A lot of my former brothers and sisters who actually have life without the possibility of parole went through the same thing that I went through. They were actually traumatized and we're not the worst people. We're not um, irredeemable. We are more than our worst act. I encourage this board to look into what we actually go through what, when it comes to our life before we commit the crime, not just the crime in itself, but look at what took place in our lives before. And I think if we actually do that, we actually have a, have, have a chance to really value the individual compared to just throwing away human beings. Human beings are, are more than throwaway people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Um, obviously by your presence here, Ms. Ms. Bustamante's presence here, life without parole does not not the full story, because you guys are obviously uh, not here, and I'd like to hear um, how you got here. But before get that go go there, I I, I want to I'd like to start with Professor Seeds and D. A. Hennessy, and and then I'll open it up to the rest of the members. I, I think everybody would agree that these are the longest and most extreme sentences, and um, we we shouldn't sentence people to terms that are not necessary to protect public safety. Um, so um, this is sort of a question to both of you, but on the opposite sides. And DA Hennessy, putting the, the re-traumatization to uh, victims aside for the moment, I, I got that point, but let's just from a pure public safety perspective, I was wondering if you could each um, give us what you think is your best evidence, uh, Professor Seeds, about why LWAP sentences are not necessary to protect public safety. And uh, DA Hennessy, if you could uh, give us your best evidence or cite the best uh, empirical research about why 
uh, LWOP sentences are necessary in order to maintain and protect public safety? Because I think that that's critical to, to me at least. So uh, Professor Seeds, would you mind starting? Sure, thank you, Chair Romano. So I would say that the utility of LWOP, I'd break it down into general deterrence and specific deterrence. And I would say it doesn't really have either. Um, general deterrence experts recognize that the certainty of apprehension of, of a crime is largely responsible for deterrent effects, not severity of sentence. I think that's been shown in criminological research. So the fact that the severity of the sentence might it, it might make it uh, more of a deterrent, more of a crime, more effective crime prevention tool, that doesn't pan out as a general theory. There has not been anywhere near the amount of research on life without parole the marginal deterrent uh, impact of life without parole as with say the death penalty. It's just, but I would say that research is beginning. Um, there's one piece that was published last year, which I cited to in the um, written statement that finds, that compares the deterrent effect of an LWAP sentence to a life with parole sentence and finds that the added deterrent effect of LWAP compared to life with parole is negligible. So. I, I would point to that as, you know, we, we don't have a lot of, of data on this, um, but I would say that's the one finding um, that we could point to. As for specific deterrence, how it, deter how it prevents crime with respect to incapacitating people longer and longer, um, studies show that involvement with crime diminishes as people aged. I think that's well established at this point. And elderly people who are sentenced to LWAP have served decades in prison, they've aged out of crime. Um, and I would add to that, incarcerated populations display biological health profiles that exceed their chronicle age by 10 to 15 years. Studies have shown this too. So people, I'd say age and 50 above, um, the National Institute of Corrections is recommended, should be considered elderly. So we might think of aging out of crime as a process that's happening um, even at an earlier age than we might initially think of otherwise. Um, also, the evidence upon release of people, formerly incarcerated people, paroled lifers on release shows that they're unlikely to reoffend. That's been shown over and over again. So, and as the committee staff memo noted, um, almost 90% of the people serving LWAP in California were assessed as having low, the lowest risk score. So whether it comes to general deterrence uh, or specific deterrence, the utility of this punishment uh, over, over a life with parole sentence uh, one that would have a review um, seems negligible. Um, thank you. I just want to interject one thing on that particular statistic about the, the risk assessments. That's, of course, that is an accurate figure in terms of the California static risk assessment, which is just one tool used to assess um, folks, the risk of folks um, who are incarcerated. Uh, other risk tools used by the Department of Corrections um, show a higher risk for uh, life prisoners. So um, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, DA Hennessy, I was wondering what your best evidence was on this. Thank you. Well, as, as uh, Christopher noted, there are no specific studies that I'm aware of that, that specifically address life without parole sentences versus life with the possibility of, possibility of parole sentences. But I think if you're going to do such a study, you would have to also look at how life with parole is, Im is, is um, implemented in the particular state. And that has certainly been in flux in California these past five or 10 years. A good 10, 15 years ago, if you were serving a life with parole or 25 to life sentence in California, you were serving a life sentence. And now it's a very different story. People are getting paroled. So that's something such a study would have to take into account. There are studies on death penalty as, a, as, as on the death penalty as an deterrent, and there's some studies that go one way, or and some studies that go the other way. So you have outcomes in both directions. That's fair to say, but in general, without a specific study, all I can point to is the high crime rates in the '90s and the implementation of various tough on crime laws, which were followed by a reduction in crime and the low crime rates we have more recently enjoyed, not so much this year in the last couple of years as things have been shifting, but those do follow tough on crime laws like the three strikes law, like the 1020 life law. So although there's no specific study um, necessarily, and I think there are some specific studies in general drawing correlation, 
none of them specifically addresses life without parole sentences, but you do see the lowering crime rate following the tough on crime laws. Um, and, as, and I wanted to mention something about aging out. Aging out is, is, is something that does happen with many individuals who are incarcerated, but it doesn't happen with everyone. And there are, there are individuals who will never age out. And I don't know if you can tell that with an algorithm. So a blanket rule that assumes that everyone age out, ages out of crime is going to result in more harm because it's very clear to me from anecdotal evidence and I can name cases that not everyone ages out. And I'm thinking of a particular group of offenders, especially um, individuals who are child molesters who sometimes also murder children simply don't age out of pedophilia. They will continue that, um, it, it appears, until their very dying day. And they're a particularly high risk group of individuals. So I would have to discourage any assumption that there's a one size fits all um, policy that's going to address public safety with respect to all of these offenders. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks. Mr. Chair, I have a couple of questions. Yes, if please, already done. please, Justice Moreno. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is for, for the uh, DA. Uh, Tennessee. Uh, I have uh, just two questions kind of age related that I'd like your views on. And the first one uh, deals with the, you know, under 18, the youth offenders and their eligibility for, for LWAP. And the second age related issue concerns the one, the issue you just raised. And that is what, what would be your position on after a certain set time of in custody on an LWAP sentence, no, no presumption that they would be eligible for, uh, for release after 20 or 25 years, but to have a parole hearing at that time, and if appropriate, uh, release, a so kind of a parole hearing uh, after a actual service of a designated period of time. And then I'll let you answer that. Then my second question would deal with the number of special circumstances. That wouldn't be life without parole. That would be life with the possibility of parole if they were entitled to a parole hearing. What right. might be an alternative consideration was, for example, in um, Mr. Harper's circumstance, right. a scenario where they were alert, if they were not, if, for example, allowed to present the evidence that he told us about in trial, and I, and I have to wonder where that evidence was at trial. Mm -hmm. um, that they could present that at a later date to the court mm -hmm. and have an evidentiary hearing on it. The parole board is not set up, I don't believe, to have significant evidentiary hearings where there's an examination of evidence such as what occurs in court with vigorous examination and cross-examination. But the failure I'm hearing in Mr. Harper's story and Mr. Ms. Bustamante's stories happened in their childhood. And I think the public somehow has this perception that we as prosecutors would have known all that when we went to trial or charged charges against them. And we're simply not privy to the personal lives of the defendant. So that would be, the burden would be on their defense attorney and on themselves to bring that information forward. But if it didn't happen then, perhaps it can happen after the fact. Perhaps there can be a post-conviction hearing for those convicted of LWAP where they're allowed to present mitigating evidence or evidence of significant good behavior while incarcerated. Right. Now, evidence and mitigation in the death penalty case is, is presented as part of the penalty phase, but there is no penalty phase in terms of a LWAP sentence, is there? Not now. Yeah, yeah. Is Perhaps that something, is you, are, you th are you thinking that that might be a good idea? That's it's certainly worth exploring either at the time of sentencing or perhaps even uh, later after the fact, after a certain uh, term of years is served, they can apply to resentence, to, to be resentenced or have that for the special circumstance dismissed mm -hmm. with an evidentiary hearing of some sort with a, you know, with a burden of proof that was reasonable and that allowed them to present the mitigation that applied in their particular case. Right, so uh, I, I just going back just a little bit on an LWAP sentence, it's true, it's without parole, but your position on say a, a, a minimum term of 25 years being eligible to be have a commutation or to have a parole hearing at that time. Uh, how this is that is gonna, different? Yeah, how this is that is, different well, than a non-life without parole? Oh, it is no different. I'm just saying where the sentence that was imposed was LWAP, uh, would they uh, be 
if you had a minimum term of 20 or 25 years, sort of what Professor Seeds was saying in terms of aging out, is there a designated amount of time that you think would be, would satisfy kind of the public safety concerns and concerns that the prosecution might have? Well, I'd like to know more about the numbers on aging out when people are, no. are judged to be aging out. And then the question no. is, should it, should it be based on the number of years they served or should it be based upon their age or a combination of factors? Combination, combination I think that the board would, would consider. Okay, yeah, my second question is, uh, you know, I, I, I participated in about 200 death penalty cases on the Supreme Court. And, you know, one of my concerns, uh, and you kind of raise this when you're talking about lying in wait, is that there's simply too many special circumstances. I think they're 24. And uh, my own view would be that it should be more like certainly under 10, maybe around six, you know, uh, killing a police officer, some very limited circumstances. Uh, and I, I think that in many cases, you know, for example, you cited the lying in wait, you know, my recollection dims, but I think there's an element of concealment and, and perhaps premeditation, but a creative prosecutor can almost always find, you know, concealment and 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 also premeditation with the short amount of time that's required uh, under the instructions for for premeditation. Are there any special circumstances that you know of in the penal code that you think maybe should be eliminated, and maybe because you can always charge more than one special circumstance and only, only if they're factually supported you can no, only charge course. special circumstances that are factually supported and if you're talking about eliminating some because there are, there are too many then yeah. the question becomes what's the right number of special circumstances and do you eliminate the ones that are used most frequently do you eliminate the ones that are used least frequently i know one that i've never heard of being used maybe we could get rid of it to a yeah. order of okay. an elected official or a judge yeah we could get rid of those because they're in the very line of duty. <laughs> however, however, one might argue that just because they're rarely used doesn't mean that circumstance is one justifying a penalty of death. Yeah. So you see my concern. You could also, if, if it's pure numbers, you could combine a number of them. Murder of a police officer, federal agent, or firefighter in the line of duty are three separate that could all be combined into That's one. Fine. Right. And you could certainly get rid of the heinous, atrocious, and cruel because I believe that one's been ruled unconstitutional. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if, if it's numbers you're looking at, you can certainly reduce the numbers simply by combining some. If you're wondering, if it's really about policy, whether something should be a special circumstance at all, yeah. that's another question. And then you're gonna start looking at perhaps the lying in wait. That, for example, the gang special circumstance, rarely used to seek death, Mm -hmm. However, gang murders are the predominant form of murder in Los Angeles County. Probably two thirds of all the murders in Los Angeles are committed by gang members with gang motivations. So do you want to potentially reduce the penalty for what is the most commonly occurring crime in, in the county? Is that the policy you wanna follow or do we want to get rid of some of the special circumstances that are, that are rarely used like murder of a judicial officer? Right. Professor, right. Professor Ochin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Romano. So my question has to do with um, uh, the assertion that um, uh, Deputy District Attorney uh, Hannessy raised uh, or, or made about the connection between uh, life without parole sentences and crime rates. Um, my understanding, and, and um, Deputy District Attorney uh, Hannessy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that studies have repeatedly demonstrated that there is not a connection between increasing rates of imprisonment or even extreme sentences and um, crime rates uh, generally. So I'm wondering if you can comment on that because it, it seems to me that there's a, I just wanna get factually correct on, on that question about the relationship between um, the number of people in prison, the length of sentences and um, crime rates. In other words, the, the broader deterrent effect. The second uh, question that I have, and perhaps uh, Professor Seeds or Deputy District Attorney Hannessy, you can answer this question, or uh, Mr. Harper or Ms. Bustamante, um, is about this question of sort of future dangerousness, which I think is often used as a justification for extreme sentences like LWAP. In other words, folks are, are dangerous, they need to be incapacitated for life. Um, 
Uh, based on my review of the literature, my understanding is that uh, less than 1% of people who are uh, convicted of homicide offenses, even serious homicide offenses like first or second degree murder, um, reoffend. Uh, particularly as they grow older and they shift uh, and they change um, and they grow. And this is something that Mr. Harper referred to. So I'm wondering if you can comment on that question. So in other words, I'm asking questions about the deterrent effect of extreme sentences like LWAP and its consistency with rationales around incapacitation and, and future dangerousness in terms of whether uh, it lines up. So I'm wondering if, if, if the panelists can comment on those two questions. Okay, uh, that was a lot, so I'll, I'll try. Um, I, the studies on incarceration, I mean, there's so many, it depends on which ones you're referring to. I know that Mr. Gascon is regularly citing studies that support what he believes is a showing that lengthier sentences um, cause recidivism rather than eliminate it. But the Criminal Justice Legal Foundation just yesterday, I believe, published a, a follow-up to that study that indicates one, Mr. Gascon doesn't cite studies, it's a single study. And um, it's a Texas study re relative only to drug offenses in that system. So that's one study that says, and I, I, it doesn't even stand for that proposition really. But overall, and if you look at the CJLF article published yesterday, there are studies that go both ways, truly. Um, I know of studies that say the death penalty is not a deterrent. I know of studies that say that not the death penalty, but executions, that executions are a deterrent and do cause reductions in crime. So the truth is you can see studies going both ways. As for um, the recidivism or aging out of murderers, um, aging out is something that occurs. And if someone commits murder and goes to a prison for 40 years and is paroled when they're 70 or 80, I imagine in many, many circumstances, they're going to have a lower point of recidivism than if they'd been released earlier. However, it's not the commission of murder that causes them to stop committing future murders. It's the aging out process and the maturation process. And I, I have had any number of cases that I've handled, in, including a couple death penalty cases, where the individual with a special circumstance was multiple murder because they had murdered again and again and again on separate occasions for separate reasons until they were caught and incarcerated. And it was only the incarceration that stopped the trail of murder. So- um, And can you tell us how many of, of such cases you've come across of, of sort of serial murders? That I've come across or that I've handled? That you've handled. I mean, at least three, three or four, right on the top of my mind. One and how many murder now, and, and how many uh, general sort of homicide uh, prosecutions have you handled personally? I've handled approximately forty. Well, I won't say handled. I say go to jury trial on. I have done jury trials on approximately forty-seven or forty-eight homicides. Thank you. I, unless other members have questions, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask one more for of DA Hennessy, and, and and we don't mean to pick on you, but uh, I really do appreciate your insights here, and I appreciate your candor. Um, I wonder, do you think um, that life without parole sentences are necessary because we don't trust the parole board to do a good job in selecting people that are good to, that are safe to be released? Or, right, that could be one idea, right? That people are so dangerous and we know it and we just don't trust the parole board to make the decision. So that's why we should have a life without parole sentence. That would make sense, that would be a, that would make logical sense to me, whether or not we trust the parole board. Um, or is it that it doesn't matter how safe these people are to be released. The crimes were so heinous that I don't care uh, if they are completely safe, completely changed, completely redeemed people, they should not be freed. I was wondering if either of those resonate for you or if there's some other reason no, the, the latter certainly resonates. Look, there, there may be a mistrust of the parole board, but if that's the problem, the parole board could be changed or the manner in which they do their job could be changed. 
But the reality is from my position, and I can't say that every prosecutor necessarily agrees with this, but there are some crimes so egregious that life in prison is fair. And as I said in my introductory statement, the, the consequences of the crime are permanent. And we're not necessarily talking about individuals who committed, as I said, a single crime. We can be talking about people who committed murder again and again and again. And the consequences that of that are permanent and devastating to the victims and the victims' families. So they can get rehabilitated and realize the wrongfulness of their ways, but why should they be relieved of the consequences of their conduct when the victims are not relieved of the consequences of their conduct? Thank you. Um, Judge Espinoza. I, I'm just gonna take the conversation in a slightly different direction. Great to see you again, Michelle. Um, as uh, the supervising judge of criminal a decade ago, I had responsibility for the reviewing all of the habeas petitions on parole denials in LA County. And I'm always interested in hearing from folks who um, were sentenced to life, but have been paroled on the process and how they experienced it. The two, um, our two panelists today, I find uh, even more interesting because of course they were sentenced to LWAP sentences. So Jared and Susan, I, just a couple of minutes on, on how, how you got here would be fascinating to me. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Ladies first, Susan. I was commuted by uh, Governor Brown in 2017, uh, right before Christmas, and went to the parole board in June and then got found suitable and went uh, came home in September of 2018. But what I wanted to say on the comment, there's a, about 140 LWAPs that have been paroled in these last three years, and it is zero recidivism. And we are all doing our best to give, doing give back. And also inside, they utilize the LWAPs because of their training, because of their groups, because of their uh, rehabilitation. They utilize the LWAPs inside to lead the groups and, and they do not see us as that dangerous, ugly, person yes there are some, maybe some people that have done multiple but for the majority people were 19 years old that got this this sentence or under 25 and their their mental state was not as of an adult and in the circumstances like jared and i lived you know there are circumstances that were not allowed in our trial no matter what how hard we tried the judge struck everything that was said and I just wanted to point that out that, you know what, the trials aren't fair. And unless, you know, being poor and not having the ability to get a, an expensive attorney, I got life without. Mr. Harper. Yes. Um, so I, I, I ended up um, filing the commutation and I was granted by, by Governor Brown. And then I was later released by Governor Newsom. Today, I am an ambassador for Represent Justice. Um, we partner with, well, we, we are a national organization. We, we, we partner with the movie Just Mercy uh, and the work of Brian Stevenson. The majority of the work that I do today in, in my community is, 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 is fighting for, for, for dignity for incarcerated people, educating the public on the, the ability that we have to change. Um, in regards to our, our, our parole system, um, the, the Board of Prison Hearings, I, I, I truly believe that that's one of the best safety mechanisms that we actually have. I went to a three and a half hour long parole hearing. Um, a lot of the men that, that actually have um, a, a sentence of, of, of um, or a sentence that would allow them to go before the parole board um, we can look at we can look at the statistics when it comes to recidivism, um, when it comes to the recidivism rate for people who have life. So that tells me that our parole board it, it really can be trusted because our recidivism rates are, are are really low. I believe that if we provided a mechanism for people who have life without the possibility of parole to go before the parole board, that that case study would be shown through an ability for a person to show that I have changed even after committing the worst act of my life. I just think that if we, if we determine that a person is irreparable 
at the beginning and we don't take into consideration the midterm or even um, later, a later stage in life, we actually, um, we actually don't do justice to even a person like me. I'm not only a, 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 a perpetrator who, who committed a crime, but I'm also a survivor. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I would have, I would have wanted, I would have wanted to know that the person who harmed me was better. I would have wanted to know that that person had the ability to actually show that they changed before coming back home or coming back out into our society. So that's what I would, that's what I would leave with that a change is possible. We all have, have made mistakes, but we all have changed. And I think people in prison who actually have life without the possibility of parole, if given the chance to show, we would see that they are redeemable. A lot of the people in Lancaster State Prison, I was in prison with, with um, almost 700 people who had life without the possibility of parole. I sat with them, I watched them die, I watched them change, I watched them cry, I watched them sit in sorrow because of what they had done. I watched people hope that society would allow them to be accountable, but life without the possibility of parole does not allow full accountability because it doesn't allow a second chance. And I think through a second chance is how you continue the accountability with the work that I'm doing and the work that people would, would be able to do if given a chance to come back out into society and actually be a contributor and not just a consumer. Thank you. Do other committee members have questions? Professor Seeds, I have a question for you. Um, we heard testimony at our last uh, hearing regarding the death penalty that in states that eliminated the death penalty, uh, the number of LWOP cases uh, went up, not just accounting for, the, for those folks who would have otherwise been uh, received a death sentence. Um, is that consistent with, are you familiar with that research? Does that seem right to you or? I don't know that, that, that there's the research that absolutely shows that, but I think the trends are apparent. And so I think that that's something that research is being done on. I think the, the phenomenon that the LWAP's not just an alternative to death, but it's actually encompassing a broader net of people who never would have gotten the death penalty or getting exposed to it. Um, I also think the, that, I mean, we can see that I think with 190.2 and how it operates also, right? Look at the number of LWAP sentences under the statute versus the number of death sentences. And um, it's expanded beyond the most right, egregious homicides to a larger range, right? And especially when we get into things like felony murder where um, intent's not required. And uh, DA Hennessy, are you familiar with AB uh, 1224? I have been reviewing the legislation. Can you remind me what the purpose of that one is? I believe that this is precisely what you were discussing before, which is an opportunity to go back to court to present evidence and to warrant resentencing for special circumstance cases. Yeah, I've been reviewing a number of those that allow an individual petition to go back to court. And I think I referenced something about a reasonable burden of proof when I spoke about that. And I don't know if this particular piece of legislation in, involves this, but there is one or two items of legislation that has a burden of proof that the people have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the petitioner will not commit future violence. That is not a realistic burden of proof. That is an absolutely 100% impossible burden of proof to meet. And it's a farce because of it, because no one can prove future conduct or the future beyond a reasonable doubt. We're not mind readers and we're not wizards. So to, to have such a hearing be legitimate, you have to have a reasonable burden of proof and evidentiary hearing befitting the standards of our present criminal justice system with robust cross-examination. Well, well, what would be a, re so the, the, the idea is that, and this is just, again, we're brainstorming here and that's part of the purpose of our committee, is to allow people who've been convicted under special circumstances to go back and challenge those special circumstances at some later point in time in court rather than going to the parole board. 
um, and have that judge to be able to resentence a person. It, uh, that's a broad outline. Uh, what would be a reasonable standard of review in your mind? Well, I would think that the petitioner would have the burden of proof, not the people, to present evidence, and it, and it could be less than beyond a reasonable doubt. It, there are various standards, you know, preponderance and um, probable cause, um, to show that these mitigating circumstances did occur with some credible evidence. And with, with respect to Mr. Harper and Ms. Bustamante, you have to realize that people who didn't suffer what they suffered will lie and submit petitions. And unless you have a burden of proof that, that requires them to prove it with some manner of competent evidence, we're going to have a lot of people less um, merit, meritorious than they are taking up court time and court space to the detriment of the people who truly deserve these hearings. So there has to be some kind of burden of proof and evidentiary showing by the petitioner to winnow it down to those deserving of such a hearing and deserving of such consideration. I, I hear that. Um, and just to make sure I understand though, th this, is your, this is an idea that would be in lieu of parole, like parole is really a question about rehabilitation and public safety, right? And, and, and you're saying um, parole is not appropriate in these cases, no matter what. But, right, I mean, that's what we said, that's what you said before, that the crimes are so heinous that no matter how safe that this person might be to re be released, that parole is not an appropriate remedy. However, what you're suggesting here, and I'm, it's, I'm, it's very interesting to me, is that um, after a certain period of time, similar to amount of time that somebody might have to wait before going to parole, uh, they could return to court and say, prove with evidence, I agree, real evidence, and we don't want liars and fake evidence and of course any of that, but prove by let's say a preponderance of evidence that the special circumstances um, were either inappropriately imposed um, or, no, or no longer apply. Is that, is that what you're suggesting might be inappropriate? Something like that, or even, for example, in the case of Mr. Harper, not necessarily that the special circumstance didn't apply, because maybe it did even given all of his circumstances, but that there is evidence mitigating his conduct that would justify the dismissal of the special circumstance and the burden of proof. And we're talking about a distinction between the parole board and a court. We're not just talking about who you trust to make a decision. We're also talking about a forum uh, designed for the exploration of evidence and a separation of powers issue where the Department of Corrections is not empowered to dismiss charges, nor, nor do I think should they be. No, I and I think that that's interesting and something that we've thought about in many different contexts is where should the court, what role should the court play after conviction? Where can and should they come in and versus the parole board and, and what who has different expertise? And I certainly agree with you that court courts are used to taking evidence this due process protections, adversarial system, whereas parole board is, is a completely different um, procedure. Um, uh, we have about five more minutes left in this hearing. I wanna welcome Senator Skinner, who I know that was delayed, Senator Skinner. Uh, we've been talking about life without parole with this panel. I don't know if you have any specific questions or if there are any uh, members of the committee who have more questions, otherwise uh, we'll adjourn for a bit. But does anybody have any last questions? Justice Moreno, are you trying yeah, to? Just, yeah. just, I, I just want to clarify uh, a clarification from, from the district attorney. Uh, my understanding, at least what I heard, is that, say, for someone who is 16, your position is, and following the law, that they're eligible for LWAP. But in terms of commuting or parole at some point down the road, however many years that is, uh, that would be something, the, the preferred approach as opposed to categorically uh, not having 16 year olds and above to 18 eligible for, for LWAP. Is that, did I state your position clearly? You, no, you I, don't, I don't think I ever addressed LWAP as applied to 16 and 17 and 18 year olds. So I, I haven't addressed that subject at all. Okay, I thought I had asked that, but I didn't get an answer. What do you think about that? You know, it's tough. There's this new body of evidence that suggests that young people's brains aren't fully right. formed and that mm -hmm. they can't understand the consequences of their actions. However, punishment is not for people who understand the consequences of their actions. 
people who understand the consequences of their actions don't commit murder to begin with just because they know it's not the right thing to do. So punishment's really designed for people who either don't understand or don't care about the consequences. Going back to the mindset of people who are, who are, whose brains are not mature, again, I think if you're really going to adopt that, that area of study, that they aren't able to engage in good decision-making, then you need to look at it at a society, societal-wide level. If young people of a certain age aren't able to um, conduct themselves in a responsible manner such that they're a danger to public safety by committing crimes, should they be voting? Should they be driving? Should they be in the military? So I think it's a larger question when you yeah. talk about how you're going to treat individuals of a certain age, not just with respect to crime, but with all the other areas in their lives where they could make poor decisions that affect other, other citizens. Thank you. Well, Senator Skinner? Your, your example is unusual, or I should, unusual is not accurate. Your example was odd in that 16 and 17 year olds are not allowed now to vote. They're not allowed to um, buy alcohol. They are excluded from the legalization of cannabis and they are not allowed in the military. They also are in, even in California now, their driving privileges are extremely limited. So uh, given that in every other part of the law in California, we have recognized that 16 and 17 year olds are not fully mature to and capable to exercise the same responsibilities or judgment as an adult. And the question of adult, our laws, I will say, are inconsistent because some are 21, some are 18. However, when it comes to 16 and 17 year olds, there's much more consistency. So do you have any revision on your views in terms of 16 and 17 year olds? Well, the law has been shifting on who's being viewed as a quote juvenile and traditionally it was 18 and below, but some of the recent shifts are including people as going up to I believe the age of 25, for example, juvenile parole. So who yes, qualifies you, as a juvenile under the law? 16 and 17 as your example. I'm sorry? You cited 16 and 17 year olds. I was referring to the question about 16, 17 and 18 year olds giving life without parole and then right. I was referring to the broader studies about young people in the formation of their brains. And I don't believe their studies are limiting that cutoff for brain formation to the age of 18. So the study area goes beyond age 18. I have a, I have a last question um, and then um, I think we're, we're out of time because I am curious about this idea about going back to court and the idea of maybe special circumstances don't apply or mitigating circumstances. Uh, DA Hennessy, is it your idea that mitigating circumstances at the time, so we heard from Mr. Harper and Ms. Bustamante about the abuse that they suffered that maybe perhaps wasn't fully fleshed out at the time of their trial or wasn't known, or maybe the science wasn't appreciated at the time, or are you talking about mit current mitigating circumstances, meaning, um, I'm no longer a risk to public safety. I'm physically incapacitated. I'm changed as a human being. Or would you say, no, this is limited to time of trial issues? And let's say we're talking 20 years later, right? So I hadn't placed a limit on it, and I'm not sure I would do that. I was thinking of the former, not the latter, because the latter is what the parole board is considering Correct. now. Correct. The, 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 the latter is a, is, is a parole board type question. I'm right. thinking about things, for instance, like battered women syndrome or childhood abuse that was not fully presented at trial, not explored. They might not, if, if their age was such and their mental maturity was such, might not have disclosed all the information to their defense attorney. Hmm. So through no fault of the defense attorney, it wasn't presented or it wasn't admissible at the time. And we're having, you know, changing societal thoughts on the effects of, effects of things like battered women syndrome and child abuse. So that's really what I was referring to. At the end of it, I wouldn't necessarily right now say it should be limited to that, but that's what I had in mind. All right, that, that's, that's, and, I, and I agree 100% that current, mitig maybe mitigating circumstances isn't the right word, but current 
dangerousness concerns are that's the specialty of the parole board or that's the step it I, seems I, to be more up what they what they're presently considering that and that's their specialty and especially and judges typically don't think that way or don't uh answer those types of questions um all right unless we have any last minute questions we're going to take a, a break between our next panel are there any last minute questions all right uh i want to just oh just sure mr harper i i I just I just wanted to speak to the to to some of the abuse that takes place. A lot of times when people don't talk about things in the beginning is because they can't, yeah. right? It's not until you actually grow um, that you're able to actually speak up and out about things. I, so I just kind of want to just add that in um, in regards to um, some type of hearing later on um, because I had a very 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 difficult time um, um, convincing. Uh, the district attorney that the things that were true um, needed to be believed by everyone. So I just I just think when we when we think about creating those type of committees, we we really want to think about the growth that people actually have, and not and not that they're creating some type of lie later on down the road, twenty years down the down the road. So I just want to. And if I could, Mr. Harper, that's exactly what I was thinking of. And, and victims of child uh, abuse very frequently do not reveal it or discuss it until they're adults. And that's quite common. And that's exactly the circumstance that I was thinking of why your defense attorney potentially could not even have known that it occurred and not presented at trial because it's just too difficult for some people to talk about until they're adults and get some kind of therapy. Yeah, and, and laws and understanding and science and evidence changes over time too, which I think everybody's acknowledging. I wanna thank everybody in this panel. Um, I, I really appreciate everybody's uh, candor and openness from you know very different perspectives. Um, you talked about uh, your story and your experience and I think you really educated me and I hope others on the committee. Thank you for your time. Um, we're really um, kind of a, a research and development uh, arm for the for the legislature and hope to uh, have just a conversation with experts and people who have been you know personally affected by these laws and be able to give good advice and you really really helped us so uh, thank you again for your time we're gonna take a um, about a 10 minute break and reconvene at 2:25 um, and I'll see you back then thank you all thank you.